So here are some of the study design aspects. So the uh, the quick summary for first in, uh, all the different components we need to think about when we think about design the first in human phase one study. So first component is related to the starting dose. So usually defined by the GLP preclinical tox, uh, usually uh, with some safety uh, safety scaling uh, factors. Um, and the second component is dose escalation, and you know depends on the safety profiles and the mechanism action of the compound. So usually you can decide how aggressive, how fast you want to do those escalation. But again, given this is first in human study, the usually there's some times to have some unexpected toxicities. So you usually we need to be more flexible and agile and adapted with the safe newer findings. And for the cohort size, uh, for the first in human study, usually uh, it's not that big. It's around six to eight subjects on active treatment, and two subjects on placebo treatment per cohort. And that we can also modify it based on the indications. For example, for oncology dose escalation, we usually only have one to three patients, depends on how where the dose we are. And also number of the dose level. Ideally, we want to control, make sure that those the level of the dose cohort in the dose escalation is ranging from five to nine possible dose levels. If you have too many dose levels, that means your study will be very long. If you have only one or two dose levels, that means you could not really find the right you didn't really you started your starting dose may be too high. So again, you I, you need to find the right sweet spot so that you can make you can have at least five to nine possible dose levels to understand the safety and also the PKPD relationship over the dose ranges. And the lastly is the maximum dose tested. So I think it depends on the indication. For example, for oncology, we usually don't cap the highest dose. But for non-clinical, non-oncology projects, so usually the non-preclinical GLP talks will define the maximum exposure you can expose for human. In that case, you probably you have to define the maximum dose you can dose for the uh, first in human patient. So I will further elaborate all these different considerations in the next few slides. So first, uh, just the overall, you know, uh, those selections. Uh, so actually, in general, it's an integrated approach. So actually, there's three possible those we need to think about when we uh, try to trigger design the first in human study. So first is the starting dose. And then uh, we also need to know where in the ballpark, ballpark is the target human efficacy dose. And the lastly, it depends on your molecule, whether you need to, your, your maximum dose was capped based on the preclinical toxicities. So I think, uh, you know, first I want to briefly touch upon how we project human efficacy dose. So basically we will leverage the preclinical efficacy study to um, both in vitro and in vivo to understanding what's the target human exposure is needed to achieve the anti, you know, the uh, active, uh, the efficacies. And then we based on the preclinical in vitro and the animal PK studies, we can project what we expect for the human PK. By combining the two, we will be able to project human efficacy dose. And then we can also think about first in human starting dose. It's mainly informed by the uh, you know, preclinical GLP talk studies, for example, no AEL, and also uh, depends on the nature of the safety, toxicity, the reversibility, monitorability, and also the target organ, et cetera, the steepness of those response curve. So based on the what's the project efficacy dose and also toxicity, toxicity profile in animals, we can decide what will be the first human starting dose. Additionally, for non-oncology non programs, based on the non uh, based on the animal talk studies, we can also define the maximum plant explorer to define the potential maximum dose we can test in first in human. So by knowing that these three different doses, we can decide how fast and that we're going to do, do the dose escalations. And now I just want to further elaborate how we're going to calculate starting dose selections. Again, there's a multiple health authority regulatory guidance. Um, you know, I think there's, so I will further elaborate. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the first in human study is safety. So safety is the main uh, driver to government, the first in human study starting dose. So we want to make sure that uh, the safety for the subjects going to be tested in the clinical. And also this uh, 
uh, these uh, different methodology selections uh, will based on the nature and the severity and the reversibility and the monitorability of the placental toxicity associated with the molecules. So there are three different methods. So the first method called the MRSD is the maximum recommended starting dose. This is based on FDA uh, guidance. So basically we want to calculate the highest starting dose that believe to be safe based on the non-clinical uh, GLP talk study, the NOAL, uh, NOAEL, is not observed adverse effect levels. And then usually we will take tenfold uh, safety scaling factors to determine the MRSD. And the second approach is called MABEL approach, is a minimum anticipated biological effect dose levels. And again, this is actually favored by the EM European health authorities. Um, so they have specific guidance for the MABEL approach. So they can either based on in vitro assay and also some sensitive assay or based on some of the in vivo activities. And the last approach is kind of happy intermediate between the first two is more like a pharmacological active dose. And the two really start with some, uh, some dose that we potentially see some PD biomarker modulations. And again, which dose we're going to, uh, which method we're going to uh, use for the first in human starting dose will depends on the nature, uh, the mechanism actions, and also nature and the severity of the toxicity we observe in the first in humans. And this is, will be the balance between the potential safety risk and also the overall exposure of the different dose levels. So we don't want our select our starting dose too high. So then you already start to see some unexpected toxicities. We also don't want to start our starting dose too low. Then it's take forever to really get into the uh, target efficacy dose. And also it's kind of waste the uh, uh, subjects, right? So if they didn't really gain any benefit, so we need a much more patient if we select starting dose too low. It's kind of waste the patient population, patients and also the resources. So why starting dose matters? Uh, actually, uh, you guys probably already uh, know the news that the tissue narrow story in 2006, uh, the CD28 super agonist antibody uh, was administered with six healthy volunteers. And uh, actually the first infusion was at the first starting dose uh, with a safety scaling factor 500 fold. As I mentioned earlier, in general, it's tenfold. In this time, based on the GLP talks from animals, from monkeys, actually they intentionally adding 500 fold scaling factors. But still, all the six subjects facing life-threatening complication, which is cytokine release syndromes, involve multiple organ failures. So here I just drew in some of the pictures. I think the patient start to lose their toes and the fingers. And the, I have to move to the intensive care. So what's went wrong? Actually, we re later on they realized, although they are actually have 500 safety margin, but they're still not enough because preclinical animal model does not necessarily reflect the pharmacology in humans. So in this case, I think in vitro, based on the middle, based on the in vitro assay, maybe approach may be potentially more, uh, more appropriate. And the other biggest lesson learned from these incidents is actually all six subject actually was dosed at the same time instead of sequentially. So ideally, if there's a potential higher safety risk, so we want to dose one patient first, observe whether they are okay from safety perspective before we want to dose the second patient uh, sequentially versus uh, you know dose everybody in the same time. And the third learning is also the phase one clinical unit actually not adequately prepared to dealing with life-threatening consequence. So I think that's also not the biggest learning we have we have now. So actually the MABEL approach is the one was rolled out after this incident. And um, another, so now I would like to move on to talk a little bit about those escalation, you know, in general, how aggressive, because I think as I mentioned earlier, for the dose escalation, how fast we want to go, we need to understand where's our starting dose, where's our target dose, and where's the cap. So I think again, you know, we, uh, as I mentioned, you know, starting dose usually at building tenfold safety factors. So as a result for dose escalation, we usually can do threefold dose escalation for the first couple of dose levels. 
And then when we start to continue accumulate data, we see some safety signal. Although not strong safety signal, we can slow down the dose escalation. For example, reduce three fold to two fold, even 1.5 fold or even 50%. So it depends on the safety we observe. And then the key goal of the dose escalation is key driver is the safety, how fast we want to go to really understand the risk uh, for the drug and other drug class based on the mechanism actions and the pharmacology and the toxicologies. And also, we want to understand the safety uh, AEs, uh, you know, ability to detect and monitor the potential risk factors, and uh, to also understand what are the early signal for this unwanted effect, and also understand the severity and the reversibility, and also how we're going to manage this type of AEs. Uh, additionally, for dose escalation, we also collect, characterize PK and PD, and understand dose exposure and the response curves. So here I just want to show you some of the example for the classical dose escalation study. Uh, in this case, we for drug S, we is a, a larger molecule monoclonal antibody. We first do the set in healthy volunteers, and then and after we getting the set results, we show set all safe, and then we go to part two, which is MAD in patient in this case. And, and so I will further elaborate a little bit first on the set design. So again, uh, we have uh, six dose cohorts, and then you can see that those escalation schema is uh, up to three, three, two, two, so 1.3. So it's around one to three for the increase of the dose. And for each dose level, we have eight patients treated with drug and two patients treated with placebo in healthy volunteers. Um, and after the set evaluation, we show actually up to of four mg per kg are safe in these healthy volunteer studies. And based on these safety findings, we do the parallel study design in this case. So we basically simultaneously treat all these patients uh, at the, across the dose from 0.5 to 3. Again, all the dose level below set, which has been shown safe. And we also have placebo arms. So in this case, we do two dose and a, a dose every uh, once every month. And after we show uh, this molecule is safe with two dose, and then we further expand to the phase part two B. We look at different schedule to once every two weeks and as once every week uh, for the same dose three mg per kg after they show safe in these uh, part two A studies. So I just want to uh, further elaborate on the capping. Uh, what's the maximum dose we can test? So here we're showing the uh, the dose levels versus the drug S uh, serum AUC. Again, you can see the green dot are the mean, uh, you know, exposures over the dose, and the, the red line is the mean exposure level associated with the monkey. Uh, monkey in this case for monoclonal antibody is the clinical relevant species, the no AER levels. So we want to make sure the highest dose tested are below the mean spore level associated no AER level, uh, no AERs in the uh, human relevant species. And here I just want to share with you some different flavor. Actually, there's a lot of, of flexibility when we designed the first in human studies. So in earlier trial, we finished the SAD and then we triggered the MAD. And in this case, this is one of the Eli Lilly compound, which already proved for the type 2 diabetes. And it's a dual GIP and a GLP-1 receptor agonist for treatment type 1 diabetes. And this molecule also has the potential to treat obesity. And this, again, this is a, a fatty acid modified peptide design sub Q administration once weekly. So instead of waiting for the sad finish, actually they do the staggering uh, escalation. So they do the level one set. Once we show safe, they simultaneously trigger two escalation. Once the sad escalation level two, and also trigger the MAD at the level one Q week regimen. So this way they can save the time, can do parallels. Uh, dose escalation. And then you, another uniqueness for this trial, they also including one cohort. Uh, you know, the blue is the healthy volunteer. They also including one cohort in the type 2 diabetes patient population. Again, for diabetes, I think we have quite a good biomarker to understand the efficacy. So I think they can quickly get a POC from this, uh, these small cohorts. 
And I also want to emphasize the stopping rule. Actually, it's mandatory to have a stopping rule in each protocol in the first human study to define when we stop um, for the dose escalation. So in general, this rule is define uh, the boundary. You know, the, the toxicity is not tolerable enough for test for the test for additional patient. So which again, this is a, a DLT definition. The dose limiting toxicities will depends on the therapeutic areas, and also the, what our understanding of the drug therapeutic index. So here are some of the example of the stopping rule for the safety. So if we have more than two out of six healthy volunteer receiving the drug in particular dose levels experience some uh, severe and clinical significant drug-related AE, or some lab abnormalities, or some significant drug-related change in vital signs and ECGs. We may potentially say stop the dose escalation. We either expand the same dose level or go to lower dose levels. And there's also other stopping dose rules related to the PKPD. For example, when we increase the dose and our exposure doesn't increase, so that means for small molecule indicating there's a lack of solubility absorptions. So even you go put a higher dose in your GI, you don't get more absorptions. Or for the other molecule, you may have saturated drug absorption process. So you know doesn't make any sense. You further increase the dose if you don't really increase your systemic exposures. And the other side, as I mentioned earlier, is mainly is the capping based on the mean spore for the predefined toxicology, no AELs. So if our upper limit of CMAX AOC reached that limit, so we could not further dose escalate. And, and related to the study patient populations, usually in the first in human study design, we have two options. We can either do healthy volunteers and also patient populations. So I further uh, try to uh, you know elaborate what's the pro and the con for the both uh, patient population, what's the strategies. So in general, for you know, typically for first in human study, we use healthy volunteers with the exception that the molecule have some genotox. So usually uh, that's it for the oncology drugs. Um, and uh, you know, when we think about the, you know, healthy volunteers, we need to think about what's the anticipated benefit risk pro ratio for the healthy volunteers versus the value, the information we collect in the studies. Uh, in general, for healthy volunteers, they're not going to gain any benefit from the treatment. So, you know, I think in general, we need to make sure they are safe. And also in general, for the novel immunomodulators, given the TG narrow incidence, the checkpoint inhibitors, usually we need to test that first in human studies uh, in patient, not healthy volunteers, during the potential safety risk and no safety risk for both uh, oncology or infectious immunology or infectious disease. And also in general for patient, uh, when we think of a patient first in human studies, so usually they can they they can tolerate more safety risk because you know they we also expect them they potentially benefit from the patient benefit from the treatment. So there are also some uh, critical difference between healthy volunteer and patient because sometimes the target only expressed in patient but not necessarily healthy volunteers due to specific target. So in this case. Healthy volunteer can only allow us to uh, assess the PK and the safety, and we could not assess the PD modulation or biomarker or efficacy. And also, you know, if the target doesn't express a lot in the healthy volunteer, but a lot in the patient, for the larger molecule, we have target immediate drug disposition. So we may only see in patient, but not necessarily in healthy volunteers. And also, you know, patient may potentially gain benefit from the treatment. So they may potentially better tolerate the drugs compared to healthy volunteers. So I think there are also different, you know, safety, you know, tolerabilities between patient and also healthy volunteers. So lastly, I think because of the patient population, uh, you know, they may also change the metabolizing uh, the drugs. So I think the patient population and the healthy volunteer, they may have different metabolism of the drugs, therefore different clearance. Mm -hmm.